areas that have researched specific areas, Africa, Europe, and come up with all the different places, Asia, and all the different countries and continents to um, explore, and then they share out with their peers what they've learned. And so they've done that. And so what you see here is the art teachers involved, and she's had kids um, create different artworks from different um, cultures. This has been, it's been really fun. It's fun, kind of fascinating facts about different places. So uh, it was great. It was great. I learned this morning. I think it was Germany offers uh, free education, free college education to their citizens, whether you're from Germany or not. And so a college education. Yeah. So. It was good. It was good details. Hey, hopefully y'all can hear me. Okay. Hey, hey, Miss Lawson. Um, hey there. <laughs> so just a couple of the highlights. Um, over half of our incoming kindergarten students, we just finished the lottery in March. And so we've got our enrollment ready for next year. And the big thing we wanna do is keep those families that are get accepted. And so immediately Hillary has been working with our admissions rep to get kids in and screened because it means that they're committed. We've had over half of those kindergarten families scheduled to come into the building, sit in front of a classroom teacher and go through a screening process. And that's been amazing because we're determining placement for next year. We're determining their readiness. We can go ahead and start making some proactive decisions about how they're performing. So I've just been super pr uh, proud of how aggressive the team has been to get our kinders ready. They're probably some of the uh, of all the kids in our building, they're the most ready when school starts, I think, just because we start the minute they get in. Um, completion of the LISA self-assessment. The LISA is a self-assessment that we do where we look at our special education program. And if we look at that with parents. We look at that with the uh, uh, staff. We look at that with um, the admin team and just start to unpack, you know, how our special education process is going. Are we servicing kids? Are they growing? And so it's just a really positive time for school-wide self-reflection. And we came up with some action steps of things we can do to improve. We just uh, are on the heels of our school-wide scholastic book fair uh, that went that we had a couple years ago. And so the PTA is in full force doing things that they would be normally doing, but just in a virtual environment. We've had good participation. A lot of our families, we did this in the fall and this one uh, would just close out in the spring. Uh, we just last week finished the celebration of our office uh, team, our office staff, they um, are phenomenal and we celebrated them last week and then uh, tutoring round three is underway, like just super proud right now we've been offered able to offer three, I think three or four six to eight weeks intensive intervention um, tutoring programs and so go out we find out who these kids are and it started out virtual and we've been able to do it in person. So it's just evolved. And so I've been really proud of that. Any questions? Staffing update at this time, we have a EC paraprofessional position that we're hiring for. What I didn't note here that I should have is we've also been allotted three TIRs. I've mentioned to you about those TIRs, teachers and residents. And so we do have three TIRs that we'll hire for too, just so that we can have teachers in the event of a teacher unable to return. We've got somebody on deck ready to go. Our current role for exposure is compassion, and we, we do that every week. The deans continue to do weekly moral focus lessons with kids and uh, wing meetings. And then you can just walk through the upcoming events. There's several between now and the end of the school year. And even though um, we started out and things were, things look very different in regards to what we were able to do, but you can see we're ending the year super strong, able to close out doing all the events we would normally be doing this time of year. Spring pictures, graduation, our EOG dates, um, field day. So just super excited. And we're not going to skip a beat because the last day of school is June the 4th. And that Monday, June the 7th, summer school starts. We keep it moving right up until the uh, July the 2nd. Any questions about any upcoming dates or events? Graduation will be outside on the field. I'm so excited. We're going to get two big old tents. We're going to get chairs. Um, each student can have two guests come and join them out for graduation and then we'll stream the rest of it. So we'll have one for kinder. It'll be eight in the morning. We'll do one for fifth. That's I think at 10. And then we'll do one for eighth grade. That is at noon that day. Yeah. We've got a DJ that's partnered with us and he'll set up speakers out there and kids will wear their Sunday best and we'll commence them.
And now we get to the fun stuff. There's a big budget cast there. Should I go into that? <laughs> yeah, you have a question. Well, as far as graduation goes, you know, I mentioned Dr. Steele and the irrigation. irrigation. system yeah. just because nobody's in. there you go that's good feedback the sod is is done and it is for but it's not being watered so it's I'll note that Came in and restocked that. Last year, we couldn't use it until we went on lockout. Yeah. And now it's it's just dry. I mean, I stuck my finger down on that inch and I couldn't do it no more. So that just means it's not been on today or probably. I think there, so what I do know is that there was a lot of work, as you see, there's, there was grass put on the field and now there's grass on the, on the hill. And when they did the netting and a lot of that work, I think there was some work done with, or a shut off of valve of that, um, for that water flow. But I'm noting about that. Thank you for mentioning that. That's good feedback. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? I'll jump in, I'll come back to board request update. Um, as a retention update at this time, that's a part of, um, it's a part that's inside of your board packet request to talk about retention update. We had about 160, um, three kids at one point on the retention list school-wide that we're monitoring after the first report cards came out in after first quarter. And those students were put on the retention list because they were either failing two or more courses or they had significant attendance issues. And so at that time we began monitoring them and our school social worker, Ms. Robertson, worked closely calling these families on a regular basis, trying to put in place um, what we call attendance corrective action plans um, to work through that. And then there were uh, three touch points that classroom teachers were required to have with parents outside of their parent-teacher conferences, letting them know, hey, I'm super concerned. We got to figure out a plan. Your kid is failing. Let's get them in tutoring. Let's get them in small groups. Let's try and provide some extra support here. Maybe you guys need to discontinue virtual and choose to come back into the building. Just trying to work through some of those things. And we ended up working our retention list down to 70 students, just finished retention meetings. Um, well, still in the thick of them, a couple of them. But at this time, we've got about 23, and it says possible retentions. Um, so some of them are different. Some of them are hard retentions. You will be retained and are ready to make that decision right now. Some of them for our kids in grades three, eight, um, there have been some conversation around that they need to be in class through the end of this school year. They need to complete the full summer school program, and they need to pass their EOG. So some of them have some contingencies to them. Um, but that's a, some contingency to it. Um, it's about 9% of our school population when we start thinking about that. And that's a lot of kids. It's more than we've ever retained before. Typically, I, I'm talking about maybe the most retained in a school year is about 10 kids, maybe 12 at the most. And they're typically um, K-2 kids because we want to stop early if we're beginning to notice gaps and things. So it's something we've taken super serious. We looked at data, we've looked at student data, and we also use what's called a lights retention scale. And it looks at the overall student. How big is the student? Have they been retained before? Do they have siblings? Um, you know, do they have involved in active parents just to determine how good a retention candidate a kid is? And it rates them in regards to an excellent candidate, a good candidate, a fair candidate, or do not retain. This is not a good idea. And so we're able to do those on most of these kids and um, just make some good decisions. And the nice thing about every single one of these meetings is that parents were a part of them. And this was not a shock or a surprise to these families. Um, and some families requested a retention for next school year. So we're working through trying to figure out what next year looks like because in my conversation with parents, we want to, even when we choose to retain, 
we don't want to do it the same. What are we going to do that's different for next year to help make sure that those kids are growing? So that's where we are right now. One of the things that we're working on to do something different is offering during the, just talked about this today, the specials classes, a intervention block. And so instead of going to music, you may for the entire quarter go and get extra support with your, your reading, you know, and you may forfeit having a music class. And so for our kids in K-5, um, they'll still <laughs> they'll still get a recess, they'll still have lunch, so they'll still have those social opportunities. But I think because of COVID, we just have to be aggressive this year, and um, it's going to mean some sacrifice, which means you might not be able to participate in music. So it is what it is, but those are some of the things we're working through. Any questions around retentions? I'll have a better outlook at the end of July. So, and why I say that, I'll have a better out, I have a better idea um, because some of these kids, like I've said, have contingencies where I've said, you need to complete the full thing of the full summer school. And so once summer school is over and testing results are in by early July, I should know what our, our final retention numbers are. Yeah. With this many kids, I do want to. Typically, it's really clear cut. Um, and in these situations, just trying to weigh if retention will be a benefit versus a detriment. I just, you know, 70. Yeah. 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 Was just in a meeting, um, like I'm always in a meeting. Um, the average number is like 118. I know that sounds like super random, but 118 students, another school 73, um, another school 125. And that's like their preliminary numbers right now as they go through their process. But I think the biggest thing, which was a good thing, is that those families involved, it just wasn't a surprise because of the process and policy we have with retention. Um, but everyone is also looking at testing, safe testing, and just where kids will fall after summer school. They don't want, because I, I know as a principal, another year or a, a retention is like the most expensive intervention in the world. And it's got to be almost 100% non-negotiable effective if you're going to have a student do that. So everyone's looking at it like case by case basis. So like your number you originally said 163, now it's down to 70. Um, folks are saying at least uh, half of the number that they originally have given their board, they don't, they're hoping not to have to retain it. But, yeah, yeah. But we want to make sure we're not penalizing just because. And I have had only two schools out of 11 not have any retentions. Um, just because of where those schools, where those students are falling academically. But the numbers are pretty high. Yeah, I think the top reasons we found students uh, being considered for retention were parents, I think, over uh, committed to thinking I could work from home and support my scholar. I see a lot of that. I'm going to keep them home. I'm nervous about sending them back. I'm at home, but holding the student accountable to solely be responsible for their work and without partnership. So for many families, that wasn't a surprise to them. They knew first, second quarter, we're invited back into the building. Hey, this isn't working out. Maybe y'all should come back in. No, we're still not ready. And so, you know, that didn't quite work. And then in other cases, a significant attendance issue, significant attendance issue. Um, kids that have not shown up, I've got a student that has got over 50 absences. That's not uncommon in some of these situations. And so that for me, those are easy. Yes, retention, those are easy ones that I have been able to confirm. You missed 50 plus days of school and we got only 180. That's an easy conversation for me to have. But for ones where the kids maybe were struggling and didn't have the help that they needed, but 
I also look back at last year's grades and the year before that's grades and the year before that's grades and they perform well. Those are ones that are a little more hard to make a clear cut decision just based off of this year. Okay, and then lastly, if you'll turn to your last page, you'll see the interim update. Um, this is our check-in two data. You can see a, a average, the average of our check-in one and check-in two. What this also includes in this um, report is the percentage of students not testing, right? We're kind of looking at that big picture. This includes only our three eight kiddos. Um, and you can see a comparison. Across the board, you can see um, some differences, but there were some downward trends across the board in regards to check in two. As fourth grade is um, one that kind of jumps out with math, they had some good games, as well as sixth grade and seventh grade. But their dips and their highs and lows, and the story across the board is just different. Each grade, and it's hard to, um, there's not, it's not a one size fit all. The reason that I say that is because some grade bands have more in-person students than at-home students. And so when they take this test, they're allowed to take this particular test at home. And so, for example, my um, fifth grade, probably two-thirds of the fifth grade is in the building. And so those results that you see are fairly accurate and represent most of fifth grade. But our um, third grade, third grade has a pretty big cluster of kids that working from home. And so it's just hard to gauge in regards to this particular data. I'm most excited. Um, we did use this information to help us move forward, but I'll be transparent. It's just been really hard with standardized assessments this year that, have, that students have been allowed to take from home. They have a lot of teeth, sink a lot of teeth into. The messaging to my parents um, over the past now two weeks has been that families need to come into the building to take their EOG test. And that's going to be our true test of, of data point, unfortunately, for every kid that we um, have seen. I've gotten pushback from maybe about three or four parents that are nervous, but the messaging is still they need to be in the building. Um, and so this is relevant data that the teachers have used, but it's also just hard to, um, it, it's hard because of all the factors behind the data. And so what teachers do during their day to day is unpack where these kids are looking at our, uh, if you look down at the bottom at the scale score distribution, it just compares us to other schools like us. In language arts, we're consistently outperforming and uh, our students, uh, with, with the exception of that students that are making grades. And that gray bar in the back is schools that are like our school. Their makeup is similar to Gates. And so where you see that we're you look at language arts, that 16% of students that are at a 1.5, um, just to compare that to other urban schools, you can see that gray bar behind in regards to how we compare to our peers. But compared to ourselves, the data has been inconsistent this year. And so teachers have had, like I said, day to day, one on one conferences, uh, grades three through five are in the middle of a boot camp at this time, and they've restructured their schedule to pull small groups and prioritize. Um, Standards, middle school has done the same thing, just focusing in on kids, um, pulling that small group, doing a very similar model that we would at this time of year, but the, the real data will come when we finish state testing in the spring. That's correct. That is correct. Um, we have fewer kids, for example, let's look at the 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is a student that's probably significantly at risk, right? Not performing well. We've got 5% of our kids in grades 3 8 that fall into that grade band, and compared to schools like Gates, um, they have 8%. I guess the average is 8% of students falling into that category. In math. Oh, okay. And as you go to the green, from the three with nine. School 
I think one of the things that is a standout though, when we start to look at those mobile students, that yellow, that yellow is always our, our window of opportunity. And so we would dive into that 18% MPLA of those kids that are 2.5s and begin action planning for them immediately. What are we doing to troubleshoot to find out? I wanna know the names of these kids. Are they in small group? How often are they meeting with the teacher? Are we using um, progress monitoring to see how they're doing? So yeah, this is, this is just kind of where we are. And as you mentioned, it does provide that comparison to other urban NHS schools down at the bottom. Any questions? So, um, if I look at the top graph and then over to your right, the percentage at or above 3.0, which is proficient to at grade level, 3.0 is ours, is our mark. Correct. And um, so that aggregate score on interim two is 35% for language arts, which translates to the same 35% down here on the green, you know, 12 plus 12 plus 11 is 35. Yes. Okay, so that's the same. And the and the 32% of the aggregate interim two is the same as the this 32 in the green bars down at the bottom. Yes. Okay. So if we were if we were to finish, you know, last year we didn't have integrate uh in the year testing. And um this year, though, we are required to do it, and uh, we're going to fall, it seemed like we will fall significantly behind uh, where we were two years ago. If this were to hold up with five weeks left in the school, are you asking me that? Are you I'm making that? Asking sense? if I'm reading it correctly. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, if we were to follow that, if we were to follow this, now, and this is where we are five weeks from now, um, we would definitely be two years from now. We were about, year in the first year, we were about 40, that first year where we made like 90% growth, we made a tremendous amount of growth in that year. We're about 40% proficient for reading and for math. Um, and then the following year, we were at about, we were a little bit more than a third, maybe like 35%, 36%. And so, fall significantly below. I think one of the things to take into account with this, so the short answer is yes, we would we'd be falling more than we did two years ago. Um, I think one of the things to take into account with this too, though, is that this is not all of our kids and that we just don't, I, don't, I do not trust the fidelity of this data in regards to it being provided in a controlled setting like that. Oh, um, yeah, I, I, I realize that it's, um, uh, an odd 15 months of, of education and that there is just a crapshoot really of what, what we're going to come up. I'm just wondering, um, is, um, I mean, it's very unfortunate that last year, our year got cut short because we probably would have scored really, really well in the year testing with our third graders having been with us for four years, the majority of them, and then everybody, all those uh, uh, grades above that having been with us for the most part four years or more. And so we were fine last year. I'm just trying to, to I wanna understand and anticipate the disappointment at the, at the end of the year on how much loss we're gonna show. Yeah. Cause we are, I mean, we're gonna have significant loss and it's not really consolation to know that everybody else out there is having significant loss too. That's not a consolation. I agree. One of the things that we've done with the data is try to figure out what our end count is. And when we try to figure out our end count, our end count will show us how many students we need to make a seat. And so there's, I mean, there's math behind it, right? We can see what our grade is. We know that our overall proficiency grade at the end of this year is 80% and that growth is 20% of our overall um, score that's our composite score that's attached to gain. And so what we have done is based on this and based on our mock POG information, 
the deans and teachers during day to days have tried to figure out how many kids do I need for us to average a seat at the end of this year. And so what they've done is drilled down into, okay, these are the kids. And then we look specifically at this data and say, how many of them are bubble kids? You no, know, we'll probably make more levers with our bubble kids. They're halfway there, they're almost there, and close those gaps. And so there has been some intentional planning around that to hopefully prevent a um, total loss, right, right, a total loss. Um, I'm optimistic. I am. Our teachers have worked really hard. I'm optimistic. And like I said, I, yeah, I'm optimistic. Yeah, I mean, the, the grade, but I do the, the grade is going to be, it doesn't really matter what the grade is. We know it's just distorted because of the last 15 months, and it doesn't, that doesn't matter. But if we, but growth, I, and I imagine that we're not going to gain any growth for the last year. And so um, that means we'll have the following year is going to be a, a massive effort to catch that growth back up. So we, we did that. It's, yeah. it's uh, unrealistic, I think, to assume that a kid is going to grow in the past in the past year beyond their grade level from where they were a year ago have additional growth and our school is not going to show that based on the circumstances that we've got. So we can throw growth out. That means that next year we're going to have to really catch them off in a significant way is what I think. I mean that there's 18% of kids at 2.5 and if they all jump over and become proficient, then all of a sudden you're at 50, 50 plus percent um, in language arts. That's not the case in um, in math, right. yeah. There's been some targeted uh, work around this too, because what you can, is, if you look in regards to math, fourth grade right now is like is doing uh, much better in regards to seeing that proficiency. And so when we look big picture, we don't just look by grade two, we look at the whole school. Where can we bank on a group? being able to carry that proficiency where we know another group may not um, or may fall short. So those are conversations taking place as well. Any questions, any additional questions behind this data or information? I don't think any of us have this question. You go and see who's going to do the best of the I think that's But I think I'm asking the question really. No, I I do think no, I don't think we're gonna have um, a significant windfall of amazing growth in this school year. I do think there will be some pockets of bright spots, and I do think that there are some um, trends in our data that have shown kids continuing to grow through even through this. It's typically kids that have been in school for the majority of their time since since school was open. Mm -hmm. We're seeing typically those trends are happening in lower grades, like fourth and fifth grade, third grade. Those are most of the kids that we have in the building. Middle school, we don't have as many students in the building and haven't had as many. But I do, I do think there will be some small bright spots. I do anticipate us, um, I don't anticipate us performing worse than where we were, uh, where we are now. And I also don't anticipate us performing worse than where we were two years ago. I think we're still at about a third of our kids being proficient. That's where we were 
the second year. The first year about 40%, but that third the second year, the third year was only about 36%, 37%. So I don't I don't imagine it being significant. I think I'd be surprised if it was. Our expectation is, you know, the zone of reality. But at the same time, understanding you doing a very good job with the circumstances, the circumstances that we should expect to price point. Exactly. And even the year that we had a, a, a great change from a C to a D, when we regressed to a D, it was by a few points that were based on proficiency um, in that growth. So we're banking a lot into growth, trying to grow those foods and see if they've grown from the last time that they've taken their ESG. So. Surely the state's going to take They're not just going to use the same standard. Uh, yeah, it's essentially going to be the same no matter what. Yeah, we all. Yeah, I mean, they're, the, the grading still, uh, there's there's a there is uh, legislation to change uh, the uh, the amount of the, the right now it's eighty percent proficient twenty percent growth is how they score and give you a grade. There's there's an entrance to change that ratio, but there's not a, an entrance an interest in changing the mech the, the two metrics that and I don't think that's going to I don't think it's going to pass the general assembly this year. I mean, I mean, if it, if it, even if it did pass, it would pass at the end of the session, which would be June thirtieth, and it wouldn't go into effect until the until the following year. But I don't think it's going to change. I think they're going to keep it like it is, and they just, I mean, they just, it's a scorecard. It's not a. I mean, we have to understand that it's always been just a scorecard. It's not a. Uh, we're the, we're number one. We're number two. We're not. We're nothing just because we score here. Every every school, but it's a way to judge and, and keep track. So um, it's just you know one of the great things about um, having a good score, a good a, a, and a very uh, a score that we're really proud of is that it helps us market our school. But at this point, we're doing a great job marketing our school anyway. And we're you know almost full and we've got a waiting list for next year in almost every grade and um and that's you know and that says that not only do people think in the community think that our, their kids are learning regardless of the pet school but they like the environment here and they like the culture that we have here and they mark like the the moral focus and the safety of our school i mean those are things that they you know it really would be a concern I think for me, if we were at, you know, only 60, if we only had 500 kids and our capacity is, you know, 750, then that would be, we would want to have a higher grade so we could attract them. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I just think that's why um, schools have been so frustrated. Like the bar has not changed for children. And at the same time, we're being told like, all state testing has to, has to happen in the school building. And even if you've been virtual all year, you can encourage families to come in and take the test. Um, but some are not mandating that. You know, families just aren't comfortable coming into the school. So um, it's like, and in, in, in some states, like in Louisiana, if you don't take it, it's a zero. So it counts against the school. And yeah. So it's just, you, we just don't know what we're going to get. But I think um, the second round of interims, all the principals are like, I was just in shock with, I didn't, I thought we were going to be even lower than we were. So, um, and there definitely is a <clears throat> disparity amongst um, virtual students who've been virtual all this time versus those who come in for hybrid and then go on to in-person. And some kids have flourished. So it just... It just really depends. How is the waiting list here mm -hmm. this year versus last year? Yeah, we've got a waiting list in all grades, um, which we're super excited about. 
mean, our biggest wait list is kindergarten, which it always is. We've got over 200 kids that are still on the waiting list for kindergarten. But in the past, we have not had a double digit waiting list for each of our grades this year we do. And so just beginning to see those trends. And one of the things that I didn't mention about the kindergarten assessment is that we screened about half of those kids and over a third of them are siblings. And so they're families that are continuing right. to join gay. Mm -hmm. Even just early on. Some questions because the numbers are uh, surprising. Well, I think it says along these lines that the community is recognizing the differences that are being offered here. The kids they know, the parents, the families, the kids they know, experience have having this experience mm -hmm. versus what they're experiencing in the county school. They want it, and they want it. doing is that remember we had a giant gap in fifth grade and then that uh, you know less than capacity students and we had to lose a class well they not only have they gained that back but we have a waiting list on the sixth grade going into next year so it's um i mean that's a that was a big i mean that was the only really giant hole that we had in capacity and it's been closed and now with the waiting list. So great job. Super proud of the new admissions rep, Sharice, and one of her one of her things, and she's gonna begin working to do this more. But with the with the hit, we just have to use our Facebook as much our social media as much mm -hmm. as we had in the past. And so just get that out. So we'll be huge. Right, You're welcome. And last thing, y'all, <laughs> seventeen thousand dollars. I know it. Let me tell you what it's for. So, one of the things that we want to implement for next school year, I'm already planning ahead, as we talk about these kids who are coming back into the building who have significant needs and we're talking about academics, I think it's really important that we not be short-sighted and also develop a plan to invest in social-emotional support for students. And so we currently use a program that's called Zones of Regulation. Our kindergarten through second grade has used it. It's been introduced to our third through eight students. We've implemented it um, as a whole school. It was introduced two years ago. It's implemented fully in our K-2 program. And it really just unpacks how students use their feelings. It's a curriculum for teachers to support that. And it's attached to our desire for next year to ensure that we're meeting the social emotional learning needs of our kids. Um, that's a part of our moral focus, but this is something that's detailed and specific that provides lesson plans, tools for teachers, how to engage with parents in regards to social emotional learning. It's just comprehensive. The $3,500 pass would go towards purchasing a single zones of regulation kit for each classroom teacher. And it would also cover a $1,000 um, professional development that would take place uh, four times throughout the school year. So the person would come quarterly to provide that PD. Any questions about that, Hefty? Um, okay. It's called a zone of regulation. It is. And is that a, a, what is it a curriculum? It is a curriculum and it's attached to, um, so our social. Oh, it's in your board packet. Sorry. It's um, zones of regulation is a curriculum, and there are free components of the curriculum, but we just have not implemented it to its fullest fidelity um, to where we can begin to see uh, true gains. When we did implement it in K2, we implemented it and introduced it to the whole school two years ago. K2 used it all last year prior to the break. The year before, they had over 600 referrals in the system, and there were significant behaviors that were going on in the K-2 wing. K-2 
tantrums, students not being able to regulate their emotions, high anxiety and frustration. The teachers were working with kids through the following year. We had about 200 referrals in the system. It's cut it significantly. So we're able to um, see with the full implementation um, the effects of it. And what it really is, is it's tools for teachers to be able to help students work through their emotions. The zones are actual zones. They're colored zones. And so a student may identify with a green zone. That's where we want most of our kids to fall. The green zone means that I'm comfortable, that I have all my needs met, that I mean, it has several different things that fit into that zone. When a student begins to get angry or overwhelmed, they're in the red zone. And so when students get into the red zone, there are different activities that the teachers can do, questions that they can ask, their social emotional um, lessons that a teacher could teach their classroom um, to work through those, those emotional pieces. The reason that it's different than moral focus is because moral focus really just focuses on um, character traits. This spends a lot more time with students working on how they're managing their feelings, emotions, frustration. Um, and we just think it'll be a good investment going into next year since we've used it now for the past two and a half years. Less behavior, more emotional. Yeah, you're, you're, it's not, it's not a reactive approach in regards to um, addressing behavior. It's a proactive approach that is really rooted in sound relationships, helping the teacher develop those relationships with that student through working through their zones of regulation, having that uh, part of the school community conversation. Um, our social worker does it now with several of the kids that she sees in small groups. And we've seen it be very successful. She's done it for the past three years and then introduced it to K2 two years ago. Um, and what we're beginning to unpack is MTSS. And you'll probably hear me talk about this next year. But what MTSS is, is, is it's multi-tiered systems of support. And you have to provide kids for support with math. You need to provide kids for support with reading. And you need to provide kids for support with behavior. And at the core level, we have a lot of tools that, um, like our behave with care system and our moral focus system that um, help with that character piece, but not a lot that help with, with the development of those social skills and um, supporting that. I had a There are many different ways, and that's what the, the curriculum would allow for them to do. Yes, they verbalize what's going their in. They begin to unpack that they're in their zone. They begin to come up with options. No, it may happen privately. It may happen privately. It wouldn't be something that, you know, you would address. I think it would just depend on the, <laughs> on the situation. Um, but no, it may happen privately. And yes, in Ms. Robertson's office, when students are in zones, they do a lot of work around unpacking body language. We've had on masks for the past year and a half. Kids don't know how to read people's face. They don't know how to read body language. They don't know how to read um, some of those soft skills that help you interpret how to handle social situations. And so what these zones will do is just kind of put tools in their toolbox to um, express how they're feeling and practice it in social settings with their peers. Um, so each teacher would be teaching? Each teacher would be implementing that zone of regulation process in that classroom. So they explain it to the students, and the students start having an issue. Do they enter class? Do they raise their hand? I don't understand how. Just about. The financial ask is for professional development and training and for the kids for each classroom. So the teacher, more or less, becomes a social worker and switches back and forth. It seems like to me to be very disruptive in the classroom. More students to know that the students are going to be able to do it. It wouldn't 
for example, in one of the K2 classes in Ms. Denny's class, um, I think they have a zones of regulation chart on their desk where students can identify what zone they're in. The teacher can immediately come over and say, hey, I noticed you're not doing your work. What's going on? Let's get focused. What zone are you in? They can identify what zone they're in. Why are you there? Because they may not be able to say, angry, frustrated. I don't know how to do this work. I don't know, you know, what we should be doing right now. And it just gives them an opportunity to identify a feeling or emotion with um, the visual representation, the colors. And it just helps to build those skills. This looks very different in 3.8 than it does in K2. And that's a part of why I want us to invest in the PD around it. We've seen it be really successful in um, K2, but also want the professional advice and support of the curriculum providers to just kind of give us advice and guidance on what this looks like at our, um, you know, in our middle school classes and in our uh, three, five classes. Kids are experiencing the exact same thing in middle school. I, we had a kid yesterday who is expressing self-harm, um, but there was a reason that it led up to that. And so he just didn't have the tools in his toolbox to say, I'm frustrated, I'm overwhelmed. This is what I need. It gives kids an opportunity to advocate for themselves. They just don't know how to use those words to be advocates for themselves. So I'll let you ponder over that while I keep going, okay? So you made mention of the more focused curriculum. So is this a complement or a contradiction or a uh, you know, two more focus. I mean, so we're not skipping our character development. No, skipping no, this would be a supplement to our character development. That, that complements. Mm -hmm. not, not, okay, gotcha. Okay. The parent engagement ask is for what you can note this item too is that one's for 21 22. They're for next year. Um, the parent engagement ask is for next year. It's a $2,000 ask, $1,000 for the fall and $1,000 for the spring. What we've used those for in the, um, what I'd like to use them for is to be able to invite parents in and do parent nights, walk through our math curriculum, walk through data, invite them in for reading night, walk through um, math, reading and walk through data. The monies would be used to um, provide food if we wanted to, snacks, raffles, things to make it engaging and get people to come out. We've had a uh, recently been able to partner with a DJ who has a sound system where it hits up into people's cars and they can come park right out here in the parking lot. And I get on a speakerphone, they hear everything I say. Mm -hmm. And we will allow us to still do the things that we've done um, and have some of that parent engagement. Our priorities for next year are the multi-tiered systems of support that I just mentioned to you, having support for reading, math, and behavior for all kids and parental engagement. We, I know that now that we've secured staff and I feel really good about where we are with staff and we're beginning to secure students, I've got to get parents more invested and more active. And so after talking with our school improvement team, they've agreed to that that should be a focus and priority for next year for the little money and to trying to keep our parents as um, engaged. The, any questions for that? The tutoring ask is for the remainder of this year. As I mentioned earlier, we're in uh, undergoing round three of tutoring, and I just want enough monies to cover the $25 an hour uh, cost it is to continue tutoring through the end of the school year. After school summer program, five grand. We'll get ESSER funds from, uh, we'll get federal monies that will help us with our summer program. and. We want to pour that money as much as we can into teachers to make it attractive and try and solicit as much support as we can. And so the majority of the money that we'll receive um, in regards to those federal dollars, we just want to pour it into teachers. I want to ask the board's hand in helping support our enrichment um, and incentive program that we want to do this summer. The summer school will run from 8 a.m. until 3 o'clock. From eight until one o'clock is instruction. From one o'clock until three o'clock, we wanna offer kids in, uh, enrichment opportunities. And so wanna partner with an after school program called Superlatives that will offer four different electives to our students. They could do, and they can choose from a menu of items. They could do karate. We'd have to choose, we'd have to give the menu and we choose four that they'd offer on site here at Gate. 
they can do karate, cooking class, a writing class, a poetry class, a music make a music a beat making class. Um, they offer a dance class. There are several electives this particular vendor partners with other vendors that offer that service. They would come into the building and provide that for our kids. And so I would the ask for five thousand dollars is because it's twenty five dollars per student to participate in that program for the four weeks that we're doing it after school. And that $5,000 ask is for us to be able to do that for 200 kids. So that's where that $5,000 ballpark is. I didn't expect to take school for more. I do. Oh, so every okay. single student that's on the retention list will be a part of our summer school program, will be invited and has been required to participate. We're inviting all of our EL families that have language barriers just to trip rise and try and provide additional support with them. And then that leaves us today with about 70 additional students that we want to pull who are in our absolute bottom quartile. Our kids who are ones, we usually pour a lot of time and energy into our bubble kids throughout the school year. We want to really push those babies that need additional help. And then lastly, excuse that typo. Summer learning incentives, there's a $2,500 ask there. Want to do a pizza party for our kids? Want to do an ice cream party for all of our kids that um, participate? Would like to also um, be able to provide bikes and tablets as an incentive giveaways for kids during that time. Yes, ma'am, bikes and tablets. It's not noted. That leaves with the grand total of seventeen thousand dollars. What questions do you have for me? But I think that we we we've got an eight thousand dollar uh, outdoor classroom furniture that we rescinded, Correct. but it's still showing up. I believe. If I'm correct, it's still showing up in our, you know, that money is coming out. Um, so we really, I think we're going to have $29,000 to spend out of this 18, and then we're going to spend $1,000 on teacher appreciation lunch, which is a week from, which is next, next Tuesday, I think. Right. And um, so we're going to, we need to plan for that thousand, but I think that um, uh, we, I, we have money for this. I will say that after July 1st, we're on to a new budget and the money that hasn't been spent will go over, but also the money rolls over. So even though we're requesting it for um, summer school or uh, the first part of next year's um, uh, all semester for the SEL curriculum or the Shannon group or whatever. We may not have those funds yet, but they'll be part of that next budget. So we need to kind of plan. And we're going to, and we'll, we're, we are going to have, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think we have plenty of money to do all this and still have some extra. So we do have the, the finances to cover that. Without a problem. He said, we do have the finance for that. Is that a problem? No, I no, I do have the money and we might have as much as eleven thousand extra dollars. So so I, if I take my twenty one and I take out the seventeen and I take it a thousand, that's eighteen, then that leaves me with three thousand dollars left. But I think that there's eight thousand dollars that Right, because on the right, next page, it's just a, a mistake, and unless it's somewhere else, on that, that there's another happen. page attached to the board report, the rollover fund request of the eight thousand to be rescinded. So I don't think it's in, included in that twenty one. Yeah. Oh, it should be. It should be. So it's really twenty. Well, thirty. No, twenty nine thousand. Really something. Mm hmm. I'm more than happy. I know that the, the biggest question mark came around the zones and regulations. PD, I'm more than happy to provide additional information on that too. Um, on that, 
um, zones of regulation, if we're currently doing it in kindergarten through second grade, where did that money come from? Because we a free part of this, we're doing a free part of this program. We okay. haven't had the only person that's been properly trained in it is our social worker. She provided the professional development to the K-2 teachers, and they've just kind of done a train-to-trainer kind of model. Mm -hmm. We would love to invest in some PD directly from the community. Okay. Okay. If it works, if it works, then the, would there be additional costs for future years, or is it just a one-time training and everybody else? I envision this being a one-time train us. Um, and, and you know what? That's not true. I envision us needing to revisit PD. I don't know. So what they offer is a $250 one-time session that we could invest in. I'd like to invest in the four sessions so that we can really implement it well throughout the year, which would give me an opportunity to do a zone regulation training um, each quarter of the year. And so I envision needing to invest in it again, but not at this magnitude um, like I would do. Said that I don't have a, I don't have a problem with personally funding and creating the fund. These kind of spend that you feel better. Maybe there's some contractual element you need to get in place to sort of set yourself up. Definitely. Okay. I really worked this year to try and get ahead of the game and do some pre planning before we go into the next year and have those um, pieces etched out and knowing what my budget could be for that. So that's a part of the why behind the asset that's going here. Can you send us the is it or is there some place where that's all that completed is look at this yes. regulation? I will. I'll send you I'll send you all the information that I have. I don't have an issue with any other except that. And I just I would like to see that's fair. Okay, so the combination of principal report or fund report, before we leave that, um, just are you asking Cindy that we don't um, include for tonight's action item? That we don't include the third monitors, or we do all of it that you want to look at. I would like to not include it. Okay. Now. Right. Okay. But I would like to not include that gas as part of the Okay. So, uh, so we're going to end up with. Um, That plus the thousand dollars, it's going to be less. It's, I think it's 850, 860 ish for the lunch that we're doing, but then, but we also have to do beverages, so it's going to be around a thousand dollars for our lunch on the thing. So, so our what we're going to allocate as far as funds, uh, Melissa will be 145. It'll be on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. You guys can come if you'd like. There would be a uh, box sandwich that are provided. We sent them a uh, menu out to the staff today. Thank you for that. Yeah, in the past, we've done a lot of really worked well with Steve. It's been very good. Um, the staff has really enjoyed it. But this year, you know, because nobody wants to see each other. <laughs> they, they're sure. They're doing box lunch. We so if all those items except for the So if you do want a box lunch, just, uh, 
upon the we, of the we haven't ordered any extra. We just sort of everybody chose their lunch. And so, but if you do, you let me, if you're going to come, you need to buy as much by yourself in your car. Then, um, <laughs> so, the, so the setting is just grab and go. They're going, yeah, they're just going to grab it and go. Yeah. I might be. If I came, then maybe me. So, are we saying add that as anything? Yeah, so, so, we're going to spend a thousand dollars on. It's, it's going to be less, but it's mm -hmm. we're going to allocate a thousand dollars for for uh, teacher appreciation lunch. Okay. Okay, and then um, we've got fourteen hundred dollars of which. There's the 2,000 parent engagement, 4,000 tutoring, 5,000 after school summer program, and 2,500 pizza party ice cream. That's going to be some good ice cream. <laughs> but, you know, it's divided by 700 people. So it's. <laughs> Got to look fast. You need a lot of money for ice cream. Maybe we should spend it off. Well, okay. Yeah. That's 14,500. Okay. So I added a C. So, so everything's going to get on our action item except for those donuts. It's just going to get pulled until the next one. Got it? You want me to add this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll actually go ahead and do that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. My God, that's a very good question. That's not going to drop in in a moment. All right. I'm going to transition if there are no more questions about the money. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um. In your handbook, I'm supposed to review with you tonight the um, uh, student parent and student handbook with a couple of updates. There are updates in it that still need to take place. Um, the tab on, there is a personal tab in there. We're aware at this time that Mr. Lawson needs to be removed as um, a member, and that's in there, and it's been noted that that will be edited and adjusted. And then also just want to bring to your attention a new piece that's in our handbook. I didn't tap this page. K seventeen, the six and changes. I'm sorry, Jamal Bailey says the six eighteen. Okay, I'm sorry. Just so I can keep up my agenda, mm -hmm. you're currently skipping. We're going down to uh, discussion items on the student teacher handbook, and we're because then we I want to come back. Okay. Calendar, oh, and that's the only thing. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Here in the handbook because okay. the calendar is here. <laughs> and then the next, the next uh, purple tab you have in your handbook is the calendar. What I provided for you is a loose copy of the most accurate. Um, so this one is one you can spend your time on. If you look at it, our school year will begin on uh, August the 19th. Uh, for this upcoming year, we've got several days laid out at the beginning of the year for professional development. We'll have a day off in September, taking right on through October, where we'll have uh, uh, two staff days for end of quarter one. Those are really important days because the very beginning of the year, we want to give teachers time to do the report cards. It's the very first time they're entering data and information about the kids. And then we'll have PD. Uh, we're able to work out a, the schedule this year. Uh, the school improvement team provided feedback. Last year is the first year that we did a week-long break for um, Thanksgiving. And so those choppy days in and out are always um, just kind of a loss because you've got a day in and you're out before. And so we're out for uh, Thanksgiving week in November. Take us into December. We have two weeks out for break, then right on into January um, for the second quarter. Uh, February, we've got 100th day of school noted and then parent-teacher conferences. The other parent-teacher conference was noted in November. So one in November and one in February. Uh, in March the 18th, that'll be a records day. That's also right around quarter three. Again, teachers at that time are inputting um, information about student concerns and all that stuff. So they'll have more time to work through that. We'll have professional development in April and spring break. Memorial Day, we're out. And then last day of school is slated for June the 7th. Excuse me, June the 8th is a half day, is the last day of school. Any questions? Okay, I believe that's all I wanted to share with you this night tonight. Yes, question for Josh. 
be it. Students have dropped off for out of the weather. Out of the weather. Mm -hmm. um, students, teachers, parents can come in and uh, have to battle the elements. Um, so we did we did send in the formal request and, and asked for uh, funding. We also talked about um, maybe if depending on how this comes back, uh, designating five thousand dollars. With, uh, with this project meeting, uh, that was a, another discussion. So we're really excited I, um, about this ask. I think when they say you're going to see this very favorable, uh, I, I'm just real. I just have a feeling we're going to get a good response on this. So uh, that that's where we are. You want to have a question? Okay, thank you, Cindy. Now we'll go to the parent handbook, parent student handbook. So there are a total of six proposed changes in your handbook. Let's slide over. I think it's on page 17 of your board packet. <clears throat> And I have been highlighting the one that has had the most conversation around um, from boards, and that is about calamity days. So when it snows, when it's a little heavy drizzle, and sometimes school is canceled, NHA is saying, well, actually, um, unless there's a mass power outage due to a storm, or like in Louisiana, we have hurricanes several times a year, and you just can't come to the school. So we are saying on those days that we normally would cancel for small little occurrences, uh, we're going to switch to virtual instruction because we now have the technology one-to-one -one ratio. and We don't 
we have learning loss and we need time to make up for that. So time and opportunity. So I want to say the calamity days, yeah, severe, it's probably on page 18 at the bottom. Severe weather and calamity day language was updated in the parental partnership attendance and emergency school procedure section. So <clears throat> there are times when you just have to cancel school um, and we will do so on um, an individual basis, but we just don't want to blanket, blanketly say school's closed if we don't have to. Um, so I know that that has um, created conversation just because we have some principals, not saying there's one here, but we have some principals who are adamantly opposed to calamity days, going to virtual instruction and just want kids to be kids during those days and times. But um, as of right now, this is a proposal that has um, gotten a lot of traction, but some folks are right on board because uh, their schools are not sitting in the best place and they are, bless you, they're just trying to maximize time and opportunity to catch up. So there are, bless you, there are six changes there, but that's one of the uh, topics that keeps coming up. And that's all for the handbook even though it goes on for pages. So even though it's a lot of language, not a lot of Right. They rarely change from year to year. Um, I remember I took all four of mine and I'm like, what has over the years? But some of the, it's just like little pieces that even though there are like 5 million red lines. And so when I looked at Gates and for these six changes, not too substantial. I mean, Calamity Day was the only one. Um, everything else is very formal-ish, Title I-ish, Title IX, things of that nature. From a legal standpoint, it has modified. Yes. So I would just go ahead and say that um, I'm in full support of the uh, extra day of instruction, whether that's virtual or into, and that we should be tied to the Delta County School System mm -hmm. for our schedule. And if we're able to just allow us, we'll allow us to stay on schedule, mm -hmm. not cut into spring break, not you know, not have to make up days at the end of the school year, right, that yeah. type of stuff. That's all I had on that. Um, the proposed 21-22 board calendar is uh, next on the agenda and the discussion items, and that is on page 77 of your board packet. And those are just the dates for the next school year that you all are scheduled to meet. And does this date and time still work for you, or you think you may want to change it? Wednesday, November 24th, and Wednesday, November December 22nd. Those are those are board dates that we um, those are meeting dates mm -hmm. that we normally change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are times when we only have to have eight meetings a year. Right. And so one of those we could even skip if we wanted to. But um, uh, there's the Wednesday the 24th, which is the day before Thanksgiving. And school is out that whole week. Mm. And that's still for your calendar, too, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we don't have to make the decision to skip it, but. Um, what, was your, what was your statement? Okay. So on November and December, those are uh, dates because we're at the end of the month that run, run in holidays. And traditionally, we have changed and modified those dates. Or, not have a meeting period because we're only required to have eight. And um, I think it's good to meet, but we could even, you know, we could skip one and plan on skipping one. But uh, the November 24th meeting is the day before Thanksgiving and school is out all that week. Same with the December. And the, and the December is um, not the day before the Christmas Eve. But you're on winter break. Before the Christmas Eve. Eve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, uh, <laughs> as a suggestion, why not meet the November on the 17th and then cancel for 
not have you want us if you want to schedule yeah, we can move either November up or move November back. So into December, like the first week or something, when school is back, um, based on whatever the action is. You know, what would we so meet on December one and then not Meet the week yeah, after. we just yeah, we're just we're going to skip a meeting. But okay, but ladies, what do you think? I support that. Is that, a, is that a the, decision, the decision to move it. I'm not. I'm not attached to what day. I don't have anything planned yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes sense. One. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you have a conflict with another board? I just ran them through my mind as you all spoke. December 1st and cancel the 22nd. Okay, got it. Is that the only change you like for the calendar? The board calendar? <clears throat> okay, let me see. Okay. So normally we don't have a meeting in July. Okay. And school's going to open up on the 19th. Mm -hmm. Okay. And teachers are back on the 10th. Do we want to move August up, have it sooner before school opens, or do you want to wait and have it after school opens? Do you want to have a runway and we'll get started? Or? This past year, you know, school wasn't open. <laughs> the before school is extremely busy time. I prefer to do it where it is. Yeah. Right. But if you want to update or, or anything before that, you know, I'll be happy to give it to you about open and PD and all that. Okay. <clears throat> we'll okay. Be we won't see you then. Board of the week, June twenty second. Well, excuse me. Never our mm -hmm. schedule. The August twenty. But if you have people in beginning of your thing I'd be happy to I'm going to ask you to, to plan on sending us uh, end of summer school okay so the battle end in July it will end in July and, um, give me um, to the end of July I'll send it once I compile all the information yeah, and data but I'll know that. Starts. here's what happened and you know we uh these kids did this, that, and the other, and it was greater, terrible. <laughs> An extra 20 days of instruction. <laughs> you know, I can share that. The next item is the 2021 Board Satisfaction Survey. So you should have received a link from me via email to complete the survey. I think it's uh, NHA's 13th year um, sending out the survey, asking them, our boards for their feedback. If you haven't completed the survey, if you could do so before this Friday, April 30th, it will only take you maybe five minutes. I have had a board member say it took them seven, so I will say five to seven minutes. It shall take you. <laughs> he had a comment. He had a comment. <laughs> and that's okay. It may, it may have taken him to, you know, a little longer. Um, and the next item. New board of directors, additions, and recruitment. And I'm just turning over to you, sir. That's right. What okay. Saying. So um, we had discussed it in previous meetings that we wanted to move up to seven board members. Um, we have had uh, a handful of people that have asked, that have contacted us about joining our board. Um, and um, I will say that uh, one, we had a parent, A.J. Inglesby, who um, uh, is a five-year parent at our school here, um, and, I, and he's very interested and very qualified and, and just uh, would be a great addition to a board, but I've convinced him to join the board at Summit Creek. And um, he came to our last board meeting for Summit Creek, and um, he is, uh, as long as we, and I took him home, uh, 
So he has some transportation issues. Uh, he's blind, but he is a great lot and I think adds a lot. And he's just interested in our charter community. And um, so I'm going to put him forth uh, at Summit Creek Academy for the board there. And so we don't have to, that uh, helps us here not make a decision against, which is good, I think. Um, because he's a parent in five year old relationship. Okay. Um, that makes sense the board for the new parent on any charter school board when they have students in the school. Do you see that as a maybe a common business come up? Then, in other words, you might have other parents kind of say, Well, you know, that board, why can't I be on this board? Yeah, how, well, I think, yeah, how justify that? Yeah, I think that it's, uh, I'm adamant, I'm only, one, you know, one voice on our board, but I'm adamant that it's a good policy for us not to have a parent at Gate City on our board here. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it adds value because, you know, there's no, you know, one of the prohibitions about having a parent would be that they have an interest, their primary interest is in their family and their kid, as opposed to the greater school. That's not going to happen for a parent over here at another school where he's making decisions for another set of, because he's not making decisions for his um, kids or a friend group or peers or you know anything like that. So I think I don't as long, I don't, I don't have a problem with uh, a parent being on the board. I'm a parent and I'm a, on the board and. Um, so, so I mean, we're going to have parents that are that are on boards, but uh, as long as they're not on in this board, as long as they're not a parent of a student here currently, then I don't have a problem. With that. But I mean, it's the board's decision. He would much rather be on the board here, but I I feel like I've convinced him to transition to Summit Creek. Where I think he—I mean, I think he'd be an asset. I, he'd be an asset here, uh, too. Um, I like him. There'll be times when he has his experiences here, and you might argue, well, that's a plus. Uh, but I think where they influence him less than maybe in some objective way. Because of his experience, so I think there are some potential. I, I don't disagree. In fact, in our last discussion, very quiet, very active, some pretty strong opinions to share. Oh, it is so. But that was appropriate that it be quiet. It was not yet. No, he handled it. So, but the point is, what he's experienced here. Anyway, yeah, please. Um, okay. I was just going to say in your next last discussion item was officers for the. Oh program. yeah. So also, also next month we have um, uh, we'll elect officers and um, uh, for the the following year starting July first and uh, any election of new board members and we've got two. Terms, I think Jeff Phillips and Amir Roberts, we need to renew your terms. So, um, and nobody has said, contacted me to say anything about leaving the board. So, um, just want to bring that up and see if there's any discussion about that. I know, Jeff, you sent out a letter this past week. Does everybody get that? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> was on him earlier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm <laughs> 
Okay, anyone else? We aren't running for any office. <laughs> Just want y'all to know that we are not running. Just do the office of that. Just okay. The little that we have. So now we're, we're ready to uh, move on to action items. So um, we do you cover, Melissa, any of the what these all these things are? Sure. They're or, um, annual meeting action items. Um, and on page, because you're all so brilliant. Uh, thank you. Page 79 of your board packet lays out um, these four items. Um, approval, of, approval of Public Records Office Board Legal Counsel, the AHERA contract, as well as appointment of Title 6, 9, and Section 504 contact. So um, the slate of four annual meeting items are... It's April and it's time, so they're on the docket for approval. Do we want to have a question or a discussion at the top? I would move approval collectively. So we have a motion and a second to approve all of our annual meeting items. Any discussion about that? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Brenton. Yes. Did you hear that motion? I did not. C Cindy made, Jeff made a motion. Cindy um, seconded it regarding the four annual meeting action items. And then we took a vote. Uh, I would vote uh, yay. <laughs> everyone good job. good job everyone did thank you sir <laughs> okay i can't i'm here and i'm in and out and i'm on the i hear you you're fine you're fine thank you <laughs> i just want to include it entertain a motion for the uh parent uh student handbook with the changes, uh, changes mm -hmm. that we're we discussing <laughs> Brenton, say aye. He raised his hand. Oh, good. And then, <laughs> so that carries. <laughs> and then approval, approval to contract to audit with, I guess, plant movement. Plant movement. Oh, a motion and a second for that. All in favor, say aye. Hand up. Okay, great. <laughs> and so that is uh, the end of our meeting um, the agenda. The C, the approval of the school improvement items that she mentioned. Yeah. We just added it earlier when um, Natasha was mentioning about um, all the different financial asks. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So I just, uh, oh, board funds. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Item number, nevertheless, that we approve. Oh, nine C. <laughs> funds request fourteen thousand five hundred dollars would include I got him. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a motion and a second. Um no, there should be no discussion. All in favor say aye. Great, that motion carries. Anything else I'd love to add? <laughs> no. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Okay, well, um, anyone uh, want to bring up anything about new business? Anything for the next meeting? Will we be here again May 26th? Yeah. Catastrophe. So. <laughs> Great. Our next meeting is May 26. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Moving a second. All say aye. Aye. Great. He's having his hand. Thank Sorry. you, sir. Are you we'll be here next month too. I, I'll be I'll be there next month. I want I, class will be done by then. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. As well. Take care. Thank you too. Bye, Mrs. Lawson.
Bye. Thank you.